pull out your message notes. Go ahead and pull them all out. And at the top of your message notes, the dictionary defines reset as the opportunity to make a fresh new start to begin again. Now, that's something that Jesus specializes in, a fresh new start and beginning again. And the Bible gives us in scripture a lot of themes, many, many theme verses uh, that we're gonna look in this series that talk about a fresh new start and a resetting uh, of your life. But let me just give you one of them today. Uh, it's at the top of your message notes there. The first verse, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, talks about the resetting of your life. It says this, you've learned the truth that is in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the truth. So in regard to your former way of life, he's talking about what you were before you were a Christian, before you met Christ, before you were born again, before you opened your heart to his love. Regarding your former way of life, put off your old self and be made new in the attitude of your mind and put on <coughs> your new self created to be like God, truly good and holy. Now, I want you to circle the phrase put off and the word phrase put on, okay? God says that once you've invited Jesus into your life and you put your trust in him, there is a process of growth and change and God resets your life in a certain way. And just like changing clothes, there are some clothes you take off, old ones, dirty ones, holy ones that are messed up, and then you put on a new set of clothes. So you take off some and you put on some others. He said, this is part of the process of God resetting your life. Now today, we're not gonna talk about the steps to resetting your life. There's a lot of them and we're gonna look at them in the weeks ahead and you don't wanna miss any of it. But Instead, I want to give you what I call the preliminaries. There are four things you need to do to get ready to have your life completely transformed. And here are the four things you have to do to get ready for a reset. Number one, start asking God to do something new in me. I start asking God to do something new in me. Now, you might wonder, is it okay for me to ask God to do something new in my life. God, I want you to do something new, something fresh, something different, something unique in my life. Can you do that? Yes. In fact, it's in the job description of Jesus Christ. First verse there under that point, Revelation 21, Jesus says, I am making everything old. No, that's not what he says, is it? I'm making everything boring. I'm making everything the same. No, he said, I'm making everything what? new this is what he does jesus transforms life so if you're tired of your old way of living this is the guy you come to i make everything new now a good prayer that you could pray is the one that david prayed in psalm 51 and in psalm 51 he asked god to create a new heart in him create a clean spirit uh, do some new work in him and in psalm 51 verse 10 i love this verse particularly in the message paraphrase where David says this, God, make a fresh start in me. I like that. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos in my life. You need this verse. Make a fresh start in me. Shape a, a, a new creation from the chaos of my life. You might wanna write that on a little card and put it on your refrigerator and memorize that verse this week. Now, it's not only a good prayer to be the start of asking God to do something new in your life, but it's also um, significant even more when you realize that David wrote this after stealing another man's wife and having the man, the husband, murdered. We got a little bit different context now. David has cr created two of the top sins up there, adultery and murder, and he's saying, God, I need you to make a fresh start in me, shape a Genesis week in the chaos of my life. What that implies is really quite good news. What it implies is that you are never too far gone for God's grace, for God's forgiveness, 
you can't do a bad enough thing that God's gonna say, ah, time out, you don't get any more chances. This is a message of grace. God, do something new in me. I have so messed it up, so screwed up my life, so made a fiasco of everything. And I've done this sin and this one and this one and this one and this one, but I need a fresh start. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you've done it with, and I don't care how long you've done it. You can get a fresh start and a life reset starting today if you'll come to God and the first preliminary is to just say, God, I need a fresh start. I'm carrying too much baggage, I'm carrying too much sin, I'm carrying too much guilt, I'm carrying too many regrets. Listen, your past is past. It's over. Did you do some dumb things? Yes, but you can't change that. You are a product of your past, but you are not a prisoner of your past. You might write that one down. In fact, you might tweet that one. Rick says, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a product of your past. You have been shaped <coughs> by the good and the bad and the ugly things in your life, but you're not a prisoner of it. You can change. That's the gospel, that's the good news. That's what Christianity is all about. There can be pushing the reset button. And I get a second chance, I get a new life, I get born again, I get new freedom. And I can get a second chance and a third chance and on and on. <clears throat> now here's what God says about your past. Are you listening? Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. Here's what God says about your past. Forget the former things and do not dwell on the past, whether it's good or bad. Instead, God says, look at the new things I'm going to do. They're already starting to happen. Can you see what I've begun to do? God says, I don't want you constantly looking in the rear view mirror. If you're always looking in the rear view mirror, you're gonna crack up while you're driving. The only way you can drive effectively is look to the future. Not look at what's behind you, but look to the future. All of the rest of your life is in the future, not in the past. As I said, your past is past. So don't dwell on it. Start asking God to do something new in me. Do you know why nothing's happening new in your life right now? Because you're not asking. Look at the next verse. James chapter four, verse two. You do not have what you want because you don't, what? Ask God for it. Circle that, start, under. You don't have it because you don't ask for it. Have you ever asked God for a reset in your life? God, I need a fresh start. I've blown it, I've made a big mistake, mistakes, plural, and uh, I need a fresh start, I need a new start, I need a, a re revamping, I need to reboot my life. This is the first preparation step. You're gonna have to start asking God, God, I want you to do something new in my life. And I pray that in the weeks ahead during this series, you're gonna be praying this prayer every day. And I want you to pray it every day this week. I want you to, when you think about it, go, God, would you do something new in my life? Would you do something fresh in my life? Would you give me a fresh start? Would you give me a, a renewed energy, renewed spirit, renewed hope, hope and heart? The first step in preparation is to ask God for a reset. Here's the second thing in preparation. These are preliminaries. Pinpoint specifically what I want changed in me. That's the second thing you do. If you wanna get a brand new start in life, pinpoint specifically what I want changed in me. Nothing becomes transforming until it becomes specific. You, you don't just say, God, I want you to change me. And God's gonna say, specifically, what do you have in mind? Change what? What do you want changed, okay? Uh, you can't change a generality. So don't just say, God, change me. Don't say change, you have to clarify, you have to identify, you have to decide where you wanna be different as a man or as a woman. Where do I wanna be different? You see, you cannot solve any problem, obviously, till first you identify it as a problem. Do you know the problems in your life? Or are you just still in denial about them all? 
Uh, you you got to identify the problems in your life. you got to clarify the problems in your life. you got to admit that they are problems in your life. Oh, no, I'm not really in debt. Oh, no, I'm not really, uh, uh, you know, habitually procrastinating. Whatever. No, I, I don't need help in, in, in an area. Well, then you, you'll be helpless. Now, the more specific you are about what you want God to change in your life, the easier it's going to be God, for God to do it and to, and to help you and to do it faster. Now, what I've done on your message notes is I've created a little checklist to jog your memory. Where do I need help? What would I like to change in my life? What are the things in my life, relationships or whatever, that I'm dissatisfied with? I'm just not cooking on all burners. I'm not on all the cylinders. So I want to do, this is worth it, for us to take some time right now in this service. This may be one of the most important things you do this week, is to take this personal inventory right now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, look closely at yourself. That means do a little self-examination. Test yourselves to see if you're really living in the faith. Okay, so here are, here are uh, you know, a dozen or so uh, areas. Let's look at these. What, where do I need a reset? What would I like God to change in my life, to give me a fresh start? How about in my connection to God? You say, well, how do I know if I need a reset there? Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt closer to God than you do right now? If the answer is yes, you need a reset. You need a reboot. You need a reconnection. So you need to check that box, yes. If you say, I've never been closer to God than I am right now, you don't need to check that one. You're copacetic, you're a-okay. How about, do I need a reset in my health and body? Like the doctors are trying to do with me right now. Do you need help uh, in, in your metabolism, in some area of your your uh, chronic illness or something. You mean I can ask God about that? Of course you can. Do I need um, a, a reset in my priorities? Are your priorities out of whack and things that really aren't important, all of a sudden you're spending all your time doing those and the things that are really important, you're not doing those? That's your, I need a reset in my priorities. Okay, check that one. Uh, how about a relationship? Do you have a relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, or whatever, and you're going, um, it's stagnating, or it may be deteriorating? Do I need a reset in that relationship? How about in your energy level? I said, I'm finding it going lower and lower. Do I need a restart there? How about in your career, in my career, or in my job? If you're out of work right now, you need a restart. If you just got laid off or fired, you're out of work, you need a restart there. How about in my thought life? I'm having thoughts that I don't like. I can't control them, um, they scare me, uh, they're the wrong kind of thoughts, I shouldn't have these kind of thoughts, uh, and they bother me. Check that. Do I need a reset in my marriage? No marriage ever stands still. At every point in your marriage, you're either growing closer together or you're drifting further apart. No marriage just stands still. So if you're not growing closer together, you're drifting apart. And maybe you need a reset in your marriage. I need to refall in love. I've had to refall in love with my life, my wife, many, many times in almost 47 years of marriage. You just have to re-up and re recommit. How about in your routines? Are your routines out of whack? You know, the routine I'm in right now, started during COVID, it's not helping me. And I need to change my routine. I need to reset there. Maybe you need to check that one. Or how about habits? Do I need to replace some bad habits with some good habits? How about in my parenting? Some of you need to reset in your parenting. And right now, uh, you, you've got to, you need to reset a relationship with one of your kids. They be in, may be an adult child, but you're out of whack with them. And you need a reset in that relationship. You check that one. How about in my time and my schedule? 
have you figured out that it's easier to fill your schedule than to fulfill your schedule? Have you discovered that it's easier to get in to something rather than to get out of it? It's easier to commit than to actually fulfill. And, and, and you, you, you say, my time's out of control, my schedule's out of control, I'm always pressured, I'm always late, whatever. You check that one, I need to reset there. How about in your self-confidence? You say, why would I need to reset my self-confidence? Well, if you've just experienced a major rejection, you probably do. If you've been rejected at work, or you've been rejected by a friend or a parent or a lover, you've been rejected by your spouse or somebody, anytime you have rejection, it, your self-confidence takes a hit. And, and you say, I need to re reset that, Lord, in my life. How about finances? Am I in denial about all the debt that I'm in? I'm just pretending it's not really there? Or do I need to reset in my dream? Now what we're gonna do, this I told you, this week is just an introduction. In the weeks ahead, we are going to cover many of these areas in detail. So I don't want you to miss any of the messages in this series on uh, you know, resetting my life, because this is news you can use. Now, before we move on, um, there is, I need to say a word to a special group of you. And that is the few of you who just now, as I went through that list, did not check a single box. <laughs> really? You're that perfect? You're in such denial you couldn't even find a single box to check? Hello? You're out of touch with the you may You must be Jesus, you're so perfect. Why don't you come up here and just take over and you start teaching, because I would certainly like to learn from somebody who's perfect. You can't find a single thing that you said, yeah, I need help in that area. If not, you, you are, it's desperate time for you. The most desperate thing is when you're out of touch with the reality in your life. And the Bible says the heart's deceitful, which means you lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. And for those of you who didn't check a single box, this is what God says to you. Next verse, Romans 12, three. Do not, do not think you are better than you really are. Decide what you really are by the amount of faith that God has given you. So I wanna highly recommend, even if you use false humility, go back and check a few things. Because trust me, you're not perfect. Trust me, there's things on that list that need a reset in your life. And if you don't understand that, you really are out of touch with your own self because nobody's perfect, we're all flawed. We know that, God knows that, and actually you know it, but you're just trying to tell yourself something different. You rationalize, you know what rationalize means? You tell yourself rational lies. <laughs> you tell yourself in your mind what your heart is telling you is wrong and your mind says, it's okay, it's not. Now, in this brief intro to the series we're gonna go into, I wanted you to hear a real life example of somebody who had their life reset and where we're going. So I want you to hear the story of Alice Park. Would you give her a warm welcome? Welcome, Alice. All right. Hi. My name is Alice. Pastor Rick asked me to share my story of how God helped me reset my life when I put all my life in his hands. It happened when I got serious about learning and applying the principles of change and recovery found in God's word. I can honestly tell you that my reset and recovery has brought positive changes in my life that I never imagined could happen to me and in me. Born in Los Angeles, I grew up in a loving Korean American Christian home. But as the third of four children, I often felt out of place, like the ugly duckling. Now, I wasn't as pretty as my smart older sister who became a successful doctor, and I wasn't the youngest like my baby brother, who seemed to me to get so much more favor and attention. And lastly, I was outranked by my older brother who was, dramatic pause, the first born son. 
In Korean culture, that is the premier position with high expectations. My siblings were taller than me, they were more attractive than me, and to top it off, the real stinger was that they all had bigger eyes. <laughs> Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you, but eye envy is, uh, is real for many of us Asians. I yearned for my parents undivided attention and resented that they gave more attention to my family's dry cleaning business. They were always busy. In reality, I know they were just trying to make ends meet. But growing up, I compartmentalized my pain, resentment, and fears, even repressing a family secret of my own sexual abuse as a child. That secret really blurred my boundaries. By college, I had become a real pro at ignoring my feelings struggling with poor boundaries and codependency. Low self-worth was the core of my life, so I became a professional people pleaser. I tried to please people, but I didn't trust them at all because of all the ways I'd been hurt. And I didn't trust God either because I doubted that God thought much of me, seeing all of my bad choices. All my suppressed pain led to a lot of bad decisions including getting stuck in a destructive, codependent, and verbally abusive relationship, which resulted in an unplanned pregnancy and unwanted abortion. But God had not forgotten me. During my low point, God led me to discover Saddleback Church. It was large enough for me to hide in the back. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> But I also felt deeply loved here in this church family. Pastor Rick told us that every week. Still, I was numbing myself with promiscuity, bad relationships, and spending myself into deep debt. I managed to get two more graduate degrees, but when I got pregnant again with the same person, believing this time would be different, that relationship quickly unraveled and deteriorated into phys physical abuse. That abuse just piled on more shame and self-loathing. I desperately needed a reset in my life. Then in September of 2007, I gave birth to my beautiful daughter, who God used to change the trajectory of my life. I knew I needed to change, but I didn't know how, and I didn't have the power to do it. Of course, being a part of this Saddleback Church family, I had heard of Celebrate Recovery, which was created by John Baker and Pastor Rick. But I had never considered it that the CR family could help me reset my life. I held the common misconception that CR was only for people struggling with addictions. Certainly not me. Also, I had not yet specifically identified what I wanted to change in me. But one day I heard someone share how they had experienced a recovery from both a hurtful relationship and from financial debt at Celebrate Recovery. That spoke to my needs and it changed my perception of what CR could do. I had just come out of another failed relationship, was struggling at work, feeling anxious, stressed, and overwhelmed all the time. I couldn't fathom a way out of my financial mess. I was stuck in repeating cycles of pain that continued year after year. I was so desperate for change and ready to try anything. So I humbly asked God to do something different in my life, and I started attending a Celebrate Recovery step study group. At that time, I was uncertain of what I was saying yes to, but that small step became the most transformative decision of my life. It began the healing journey of resetting my life. God replaced my hurt with healing. Then he replaced my pressure with peace. And finally, He reset my, reset my resentment with restoration. Through studying and applying God's word in my life in the fellowship of CR, I gained the power to face the chaos and destruction that my poor choices kept creating in my life. My emotions, finances, and even my physical health began improving when I started practicing God's principles. My old habits of people pleasing, always trying to control and fix everything, and staying in an abusive relationship out of fear, these powerful patterns began to break and change. With God's help, I faced the bucket of wounds of my past. 
I identified my emotional triggers and I learned how to say no. Not only did I become more healthy, so did my relationships with my daughter. I wasn't parenting her with an empty heart. I'm so grateful to God that he loved me at my worst and led me to our Saddleback family and celebrate recovery. I'm now doing life together with my dearest friends and I also enjoy an intimate relationship with Jesus. I can now feel his love and I'm learning to base my identity and self-worth how my heavenly father sees me instead of who the world says I am or what I do. And this is also a pressure reliever. God's principles in CR helped me out of my denial and my deep financial debt. I surrendered my finances to God and asked him to do a reset in that area too, doing it God's way. I put him first in my finances. I started tithing and budgeting consistently and now I'm closer to being debt-free than I've ever been. In closing, let me say that I don't know the struggle you're going through right now, but I have learned you're not going to get better on your own. We need each other. One of Saddleback's slogans is we are better together and that is 100% true. Staying connected to our church family and to my CR family has proven to be a lifeline for me through job losses, my breast cancer diagnosis in 2018, the COVID pandemic and many other rough spots. I'm never going back to the way, to the old way of living. You, if you are looking for a safe place that offers non-judgmental love as you let God do a reset, life reset in you, I can testify that Saddleback and CR are places of true healing and hope. We want you and we want you to join us in the journey to healing and wholeness, regardless of what problems you bring with you. The love and grace and power of Jesus Christ has reset my life and recovered my joy. But it's available to you too. So come and join us and God will bless you too. Thank you. All right, that was incredible. That's a good example of where we're going this, in this uh, series together. Now this weekend, we're just identifying the four preliminary steps to prepare you for a personal life reset. And everybody needs a reset at different stages in their life. You're gonna need several of them in your lifetime. Step one and preliminary, start asking God to do something new in your life. Step two, pinpoint specifically what you want God to change in your life. Now the third step of preparation is this. Find some people to support my reset. Find some people to support my reset. You're not gonna get better on your own. You're not gonna get reset by yourself. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 says this. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. And there are three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. There are some things in your life you need to conquer about you, but you're never gonna conquer them by yourself. Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing, getting other people involved. Now, you don't need a bunch of people in your reset plan in your recovery plan, in your reboot plan of your life. But you do need a few. I'm talking two or three or four people. Ecclesiastes 4.10. If one person falls, another can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall are in real trouble. You are going to fall. Count on it. In your reset program for your life. You're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna stumble. There are gonna be days you feel like giving up. You say, it's not worth it, it is worth it. And that's when you need other people that when you fall, they help you up. And you say, I don't even know if I believe in God right now. That's when you need people who say, that's okay, we'll believe God for you right now. Everybody needs stretcher bearers in their life. So when you're going through major pain, they can carry you. And then when they're in pain, you can carry them. 
That's what family is all about. That's what the church family is all about. So write this down. Community is God's antidote to discouragement, to defeat, and to failure. If you're discouraged, if you feel defeated, if you feel like a failure, I can tell you right now, you're not in community. You're not in true koinonia, true community, true relationship of friendship. Now, God says this about us, because we're, as Christians, Romans 12, verse 5, since we are one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. Now, Hebrews 10, 25 says this. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. The problem with COVID is COVID was a group killer, and it was a fellowship killer. Every church in America right now is in rebuilding phase because a lot of people just got out of the habit of going to their group or going to service and things like that. And so we've got to rebuild, but the bottom is we build better together. Don't try to do a major life reset on your own because you're going to fail. Okay, I'm just guarantee it. You're not going to stick with it. You need other people in your life. God wired it that we need others. Why? because it requires humility. The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. The proud think they can do everything on their own. I don't need anybody else to help me. That's called pride, and that's why you're in the mess you're in right now, and why you can't get out of it, why you're stuck. Humility says, I need God and I need other people. I need brothers and sisters in my life. Now here's the fourth preliminary step. This is just getting us set up for the whole series. Number four. Eliminate anything unhelpful or unhealthy in my life. Eliminate anything unhelpful or unhealthy in my life. Now, you know what we're talking about here. If, if you've ever gone on a diet, you know the first thing you do is you go to your, your kitchen and you start throwing away all the junk food so you're not tempted by it. You clean out your cabinet and you clean out your refrigerator of all the stuff you know I really don't want to be eating that and, and you clean that out you clean out the junk food because you know you can't get healthy until you do but what about the junk food you put in your mind maybe you need to cancel your cable subscription for a few months or maybe you need to do a media fast and stay off of social media for two or three months I'm certain your mood would improve You'd feel less stressed. You'd feel uh, less uh, in com competition with everybody else. And uh, you'd feel your, your joy would come up a whole lot higher. So here's what the Bible says about eliminating anything unhelpful and unhealthy. Hebrews 12:1. We should remove anything from our lives that would get in the way and the sins that hold us back. Anything that gets in the way or sins that hold us back. Hebrews 12, one and two in the CEV version says this. We must get rid of everything that slows down our progress, especially those sins that just won't let go. And you know what they are in your life. We must be determined to run the race that ahead of us. And we must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us. So here's the big question. Here's the fourth question, write this down. What do I need to get rid of or let go of? What do I need to get rid of or let go of if I'm going to have a major reset in my life? I'm going to become the man God always intended me to be. I'm going to become the woman God always intended me to be. What do I need to let go of? What do I need to get rid of? Maybe a relationship that's out of whack. You know, if uh, you say, well, I'm trying to help them come to Christ. That's a good thing. But if I come up here to the edge and I'm trying to bring, lift you up and you're trying to bring me down, who's going to win? There's no question. Okay? It's more likely that that friend's going to bring you down than you bring them up. It's just the law of gravity. And, and so that doesn't mean you don't love them, pray for them, but you can't be friends with people who are going in a different direction than the reset you want to make in your life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 7 to 10 talks about in order to prepare for the new me, I'm going to have to change some attitudes too. 
Now, this is easier said than done. We'll go into it in detail in the weeks ahead. In Colossians 3, 7 to 10, it says this. You used to live, you used to live, this is your former life, according to the selfish desires. In other words, I just did what's best for me. Forget anybody else, I just do what's best for me. When your life was dominated by them, by their selfish desires. But now, now that you're Christian, you must get rid of all these things. And he gives an example. Anger, hot temper, hating others, even those of a different political party. No insults. Well, that just ruled out much of the internet. No filthy talk must ever come out of your lips. And stop lying to each other, for you have put off your old self and its habits, and you've put on your new self. That's called a life reset. God would say to you what he told Job. Look at the next verse, Job 11. He says, God told Job, who had been through a lot, put your heart right, reach out to God, get rid of evil and wrong for your home. Get rid of that, get, all, get those porno magazines off, out of your house and on your computer. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then, he says, if you'll do these things, then, he says, all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remember no more. It's like water under the bridge. Nobody's gonna remember it. Your life will be brighter than the sunshine at noon and you're gonna live secure and full of hope. Oh, you guys, as your pastor, the guy who prays for you all the time, I want you to have that kind of life. I want you to live secure and full of hope. I want your days to be brighter than noonday sun. What do you do? What he says there, put your heart right, reach out to God, get rid of the junk in your home, then face the world again. Now, most of you know the Lord. You've already stepped across the line, but there may be some people here who haven't quite yet opened their life to Christ. And if so, the last verse is for you, which says this. Here's what happens when you open your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I'm asking you to come into my life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says this. When somebody becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. That's a reset. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. And it doesn't matter what's been in your past, no matter how ashamed or sick or weird or sinful or what, doesn't matter what it is, regrets in your life, he goes, you're a new person. And if you die after you've given your life to Christ, you go to heaven, you say, now, Lord, about that sin I committed four years ago, he said, what sin? What are you talking about? It's forgiven, it's forgotten, it's wiped out. You be, you're a new person, you're not the same anymore. That's called a life reset. Let's bow our heads. So let's start this journey together, friends. Why don't you just pray this prayer? Start by saying, God, I'm asking you to do something new in me starting this week. Lord, you say you make everything new. I'm asking you to make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos in my life. Say, Lord, help me to forget the former things and look at the new thing you're gonna do in my life. It's already starting to happen. Help me to see it. I'm asking you to do something new and fresh in my life starting this week. And then say, Lord, I want you to help me specifically pinpoint what needs to be changed. We go over that list again and think of anything else to look closely at my life and figure out what's out of whack and what needs to change. I wanna stop living in denial. I don't wanna think that I'm better than I really am. And then Lord, help me to find some people who will support me. Uh, and as I'm working on this life reset, that they will be encouragers, not discouragers. Help me to realize that community is the antidote to discouragement and defeat and failure. Help me to realize that we belong together and I need 
others in my life. And then, Father, I ask you to help me to eliminate anything unhelpful or unhealthy, to do cleaning house, spring cleaning in my mind, in my body, in my relationships, spring cleaning in every area of my life. Show me what I need to get rid of or what I need to let go of in order to prepare for the new me. God, I'm asking you to reset my life. Put me on a new start, a fresh beginning. And if you've never invited Christ in your life, say, Jesus Christ, come in. I, I open my heart as best I know how. Put your spirit of love in me. I want to learn to love you and trust you. And I ask you to accept me into your family. In your name I pray. Amen.